Hello and welcome to another reaction video. Today, the second biggest Harry Potter YouTuber is going to watch a video from the biggest Harry Potter YouTuber, the Super Carlin Brothers. So many people have asked me what I thought about their Dumbledore's Plan series, which was a seven part series that they did a while back, I think like three years ago. And honestly, I never watched it. So I thought, why not watch it and document it for you guys? Obviously this is unscripted because I'm just reacting to the video. Um, it's about an hour and 53 minutes, but I'm probably gonna cut it down and just edit to the best parts. But yeah, this should be fun. If you like this video, hit that like button. It will greatly help the channel with the algorithm. And if you like what you see, hit that subscribe button. And you can also follow me on all of my socials, all of which are linked down below, and all of which house similar content that I do here on this channel. So if you like what I do on this channel, you'll probably like these two, especially the Twitter and TikTok. Now, let's get into it. Hey, brother! I love their intro. Such a cool intro. Um, so... If you guys don't aren't familiar with Super Carlin Brothers, it's Jay and Ben, and I believe that Jay is the one that does this series. After Voldemort attacks Harry and loses his powers and goes into hiding, Dumbledore does nothing to hunt him down and finish him off for good, even though he is certain Voldemort will return. So if I'm right, I'm, I believe that he did that because he knew he couldn't be the one to kill Voldemort because he had heard the prophecy and it had to be the boy born as the seventh month dies, either Harry or Neville. But what this prophecy means to Dumbledore is that it won't be him who does it. There, yeah, they said it. <laughs> they, they're all, they know what I'm talking about. Every mystery Harry thinks he's solving is being presented to him by Dumbledore. Every significant moment of Harry's life is being carefully constructed behind the scenes by Dumbledore as part of Dumbledore's big plan. That was a good setup. I feel like this is where the theories are going to start, so I'm excited. Super Carlin Brothers are the king of Harry Potter theories, so let's see what we got. So, first step control Harry's friend group, and make sure he's not in Slytherin. It's funny that they said that because they actually just recently did a series on what if Harry was in Slytherin. Those first two days he spends with Hagrid are crucial. They seriously set up a lot of where Harry goes for the rest of his time in the wizarding world. So they're saying that Dumbledore sent Hagrid to get Harry, but what if... Harry had gotten his letter? What if the Dursleys had let him get his letter? Would Hagrid still have come? Was that always the plan for Hagrid to come and get Harry? I guess, yeah, like I guess um, Dumbledore did offer to take Tom Riddle, aka Voldemort, into Diagon Alley because he was new to the Wizarding World. So I guess Hagrid was always going to do that for Harry, which was Dumbledore's plan. So yeah, that adds up. But one of the really big moments they have is when Hagrid tells Harry which house at Hogwarts is the bad one. That's not a witch or wizard who went bad, it wasn't in Slytherin. Which even as Hagrid is saying, it doesn't make a ton of sense because at that moment, he believed Sirius to have murdered 13 people and Sirius wasn't Gryffindor and he knows Sirius because he borrowed his bike, so you called out Hagrid. Except that you're not because Dumbledore told you to tell Harry this. I guess it was pretty easy for Dumbledore to say like, tell Harry that Gryffindor is the best because obviously Hagrid was a Gryffindor. Although, Super Carlin Brothers made a video that said that Hagrid was a Hufflepuff. They were theorizing that, which I never really understood because it was always confirmed that Hagrid was a Gryffindor. I never watched the video, so maybe they say that. And let me just say, there's nothing wrong with being in Slytherin. I'm pretty, that's funny, I'm pretty sure he's a Slytherin. I think that's why he said that. Have you ever thought it was odd that Mrs. Weasley didn't know the platform number the Hogwarts Express was leaving from? So, I my last video, the theory video, this was the theory that everybody was like, oh, Super, Car Super Carlin Brothers talked about this in their Dumbledore's plan video. So my explanation for this was that Mrs. Weasley was testing Ginny because Ginny had not yet gone to Hogwarts, so it was up to Mrs. Weasley to educate her. Let's see what they have to say about it, though. Now what's the platform number, said the boy's mother. Nine and three quarters, piped up a girl, also redheaded, who was holding her hand. I love the British accent that he does, he nails that. And if my math is right, and yes, we did pay the math budget for this one, this is her 17th time arriving at the station for the train to leave. Yeah, I guess it is, yeah. 
I mean, I'm gonna trust their math. I'm not about to do that math in my head, but yeah, that's that's crazy. 17 times. So yeah, definitely like she knew what it was called. This theory would suggest that Mrs. Weasley is saying this out loud specifically so that Harry will meet the Weasleys before any other wizarding family. Which yes, does mean Dumbledore would have arranged this with her ahead of time. Oh, that's genius. Cause I guess the Weasleys would be the ideal family for Harry to meet at first. They're a pure blood family, but they have good um, blood purity beliefs. They don't believe in blood purity. Yeah, that makes so much sense. Dumbledore would want the Weasleys to be placed there. And that's why Mrs. Weasley said that. She's been there 17 times, so she knew the platform number. She was just trying to get Harry's attention. Wow. The Weasleys are the perfect family for Dumbledore to surround Harry with. And it would mean the first peers Harry would come into contact with would be a prefect, Percy, possibly the two most popular kids at school, Fred and George, and a boy in Harry's own year, Ron, all of whom are from a family famously in Gryffindor. Yeah, that's pretty much what I just said, but I didn't think about the having a prefect, the two most popular kids in school, and someone in Harry's year. That makes that theory add up even more. I'm loving this so far. The mirror of Erised. And make no mistake, Dumbledore absolutely intended Harry to find that mirror specifically so he could see what Harry would see. Interesting. So Dumbledore always intended for Harry to find the mirror and he gave him the invisibility cloak right before he found the mirror, meaning that he intended for Harry to get that invisibility cloak, go out, walk through the halls late at night, just like his father James, using the same cloak that James used and he knew that he would find the mirror. That's, wow, that's so cool. Why is it taking him so long to put the stone in the mirror and the mirror in the basement? I, wherever this is, second chamber of secrets, they never explain where they go. What I understand is that somewhere on the third floor of the castle, there's just a hole. <laughs> like a deep one. <laughs> Yeah, honestly, like, yeah, it's the third floor corridor, but yeah, it does just kind of go down a trap door. Yeah, like, honestly, like, where is that? Where is this in the school, and why is it never popped up before or after? I guess, if you, like, Hogwarts Legacy is canon. I guess there's, like, a ton of different secrets in Hogwarts Castle, and Hogwarts has always been known for many secrets, so I guess there's just a second chamber of secrets, like Jay said. That's hilarious. The way he said it, like, like a deep one. That's really funny. I'm sure we're not the first to wonder why the obstacles guarding the stone are so easily defeatable by a first year when they're supposed to be keeping out Voldemort. So I actually made a TikTok about this and I said that all of the obstacles were useless. What it comes down to is if you want the stone and intend to use it, the mirror won't give it to you. But if you want the stone and intend not to use it like Harry did, you will get the stone. So the stone is always guarded by from Quirrell. There's no way he can get it because he planned to use it. So all of the obstacles are pointless, basically. Well, this theory suggests that the obstacles are the obstacles specifically because Dumbledore is testing if Harry Potter can break through them. Oh, so they're tests for Harry. Although it's not just a test for Harry because he would not have gotten through that without Ron and Hermione. Hermione figuring out the potion, Ron figuring out the chess. Well, I guess Dumbledore did always count on Harry having help from his friends. He told Harry to tell them everything when he was training him in the Half-Blood Prince and he counted on them to all go hunt the Horcruxes in the seventh book. So I guess it makes sense. When he's testing Harry, he has to test the Golden Trio all together because he always counts on all three of them. It's 100% safe because of the enchantments Dumbledore himself puts on the mirror, which if you ask me, renders all of the rest of the obstacles kind of pointless. So yeah, that's what I said about my in my TikTok. I basically said that exact same thing. In fact, I dare say the obstacles themselves were chosen specifically because of Harry, Ron, and Hermione's skill set. Catching the key on the broom, that's all Harry. The giant chess set, that's all Ron. The potions logic puzzle, that is all Hermione. Even taking down the troll, pff, they already did that. So what Jay is saying is that the obstacles we're not there at the beginning of the book. 
It wasn't there until much later because Dumbledore watched the trio, found their strengths, Hermione is like the potions, Ron the chess, Harry Quidditch, and then made it. So those obstacles weren't there for the beginning of the school year. It's only when Dumbledore put them there, which makes sense because the mirror wasn't down there. It was upstairs where Harry obviously found it. Wow. So yeah, when the mirror went down, that's when all of the obstacles came down around Christmas time. And don't even get me started on all the times Hagrid lets slip a whole bunch of clues. I shouldn't have said that. Shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have told you that. <laughs> so, so honestly, yeah, I could see that. Like Hagrid is so loyal to Dumbledore. So I guess Hagrid was in on it. Hagrid, oh, would Hagrid know that what Dumbledore was doing? Would Dumbledore just say, do this, and Hagrid didn't question him because he's so loyal to him? Honestly, I feel like that's the case. I feel like Hagrid wouldn't know that he was sort of being manipulated by Dumbledore who told him to do this. He just sort of blindly follows him. My bet is that Flamel decided well before the events of this book that he was ready to die and just allowed Dumbledore to use the stone as bait, I guess, to test Harry. So Flamel was in on it too. He Dumbledore probably went to him and was, and was like, this is the case, this is what I want to do. And Flamel was like, yeah, I'm ready to die. That's crazy. So Hagrid was possibly in on it and Flamel was in on it. Interesting. I would love to see a conversation between Dumbledore and Flamel about this boy, Harry. I wonder if Dumbledore would talk to Flamel about the prophecy because he didn't tell anybody else. That, I would love to be a fly on the wall for that conversation. Welcome to part two of Dumbledore's big plan. Did, did he wear the same shirt? So th this is like a seven part series. So I guess he wore the same shirt one week and then the next week after that. That's dedication. I, that's a lot of laundry to do. It is immensely important from his perspective that Harry never have a big head about anything. So that makes total sense because Dumbledore obviously had a very big head, winning all of these trophies, these awards when he was in school and then being like one of the most celebrated Hogwarts students of all time when he graduated. And it did go to his head. Like it led to him plotting with Grindelwald to take over the world. So obviously it makes sense that he would not want Harry to go down that same path. Plus he's the son of James Potter, who was a notoriously popular and arrogant student. That also makes sense. Dumbledore knowing James, he didn't want Harry to follow not only down his same path, but his father's same path as well. Especially when he starts the year by flying a car and crashing into a tree on the cool grounds, which I think we can all agree, pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that was great editing. I love that little, <laughs> I love that little effect, especially the sound effects that Jay made. Hire Gilderoy Lockhart, a walking billboard of what Harry could become if he lets his ego inflate too much. That's perfect. He showed Harry the most arrogant, the most obnoxious person and made him take his classes every single week. When Harry sees that arrogance, he wouldn't want any part of it. He wouldn't want to go down Lockhart's path. That's genius. Which brings me to point number two, teaching him Expelliarmus. Tom, riddle me this. <laughs> Tom, riddle me this. I love that. In what world would Severus Snape agree to be the assistant to Gilderoy Lockhart in a dueling club? That's so true. He was told by Dumbledore to do this so that Harry could learn Expelliarmus, knowing that Lockhart would never be able to teach him that. I mean, come on, Harry, you had a golden opportunity here to stun Stan, and as he's falling down to earth, just yell back at him, what you fell over for? <laughs> Honestly, Jay does the best impressions from the movies. That was a really good one. I fell over. What you fell over for? But Harry's loyalty to Dumbledore is crucial. The question though is how does Dumbledore earn his loyalty? And I think the answer is Hagrid. So Hagrid is in on the plan again, whether he knows it or not, but Hagrid is the key to a lot of this, honestly. He took Harry to Diagon Alley. He t gave Harry clues in the first book. And now I'm, I'm interested to see how Hagrid is involved. We haven't heard it yet. It must look to Harry like this was a true act of loyalty from Dumbledore towards Hagrid. And that, in turn, is what makes Harry loyal to Dumbledore. Oh, okay. So yeah, Hagrid is the key for this. Harry seeing that Dumbledore is loyal to Hagrid makes Harry loyal to Dumbledore. 
Welcome to part three of Dumbledore's big plan. He still has the same shirt on. Still the same shirt. That's commitment right there. Three weeks in a row. Doesn't the prophecy also say that only Voldemort can kill Harry? Yes, it does say that. So, okay, so the way I see that is neither can live while the other survives. That doesn't necessarily mean that Harry is invincible to everybody killing him besides Voldemort. But that's an interesting thought, honestly. But yeah, considering that Dumbledore was worried that Sirius could kill Harry, I think that proves that Harry isn't invincible from everybody but Voldemort. He is, other people can kill him. Prisoner is unique in that it is the only book, except Philosopher's Stone, where Harry is not invited to the Weasleys during the summer. Yeah, I guess Chamber he was, Prisoner he wasn't, Goblet of Fire he was to go to the Quidditch World Cup, Order of the Phoenix, yeah, he went to Grimmauld Place, where the Weasleys were, Half-Blood Prince, yeah, he went, and then Deathly Hallows, yeah, he came for the wedding. Yeah, so that is the only, Prisoner is the only one where he wasn't invited. We've talked before about how Molly and Arthur are Dumbledore's deputies, and I think this lack of an invitation is at his request. He suggested they take the trip to Egypt so they would have a reasonable excuse to not invite Harry over. So it was Dumbledore's idea to send them to Egypt. That makes you wonder, was he the reason why they won that prize money in the first place? And I also always wonder, like, they're so poor. They need so many things, but they decided to go on a trip to Egypt when they get a boatload of money instead of spending it responsibly. I guess Dumbledore was the one that told them to do that obviously to cover up for them not inviting Harry over to their place that summer. Did you ever think it was odd that Florian Fortescue kept giving Harry so many free Sundays during his lengthy stay at the Leaky Cauldron? Because that is not how you run a successful ice cream business. <laughs> That's hilarious. It is a great way to keep an eye on Harry because guess whose ancestor happened to be a headmaster at Hogwarts? Oh, what's his name? Dexter Fortescue, Florian Fortescue's ancestor. He was a headmaster at Hogwarts. Mm -hmm. One Florian Fortescue. Meaning his ancestor, Dexter Fortescue, has a portrait in the headmaster's office. And I would just bet money that he has another one in the ice cream shop and that Dumbledore was just getting reports. That's genius. That is the best theory that they've come up so come up with so far in this video. That's genius. It's just like Phineas Nigelis Black. He reported back and forth at Grimmauld Place and Hogwarts because he was a headmaster as well. Wow. So Dexter Fortescue probably has a portrait in Florian Fortescue's ice cream shop. Genius. Ah, but what about the Marauder's map, you might be wondering? Is it possible that Dumbledore intended the twins to give it to him? N no, I don't think so. There's no way. I, cu I couldn't think of a way that they would do that. I'm excited to see what they say though. Let's see, let's see. Well, we did consider this, but ultimately, no. Yeah, okay, we're on the same page. We're on the same page. Learning what Harry sees when he comes face to face with a bog art is sort of the opposite of finding out what Harry saw in the mirror of Erised in Philosopher's Stone. But both pieces of information really reveal a lot about Harry's character to Dumbledore. Interesting. I never thought about it like that. Both show the opposite ends, what he truly desires and what he truly fears. Super Carlin Brothers, I love the way you talk and think about Harry Potter, I really do. This also makes me wonder, did Dumbledore then tell Lupin what to do for his first lesson with the Boggart? Because if you think about it, he did that same lesson in Crimes of Grindelwald. But the big giveaway that Dumbledore is actually the one behind the Bogart lesson comes from Crimes of Grindelwald, where you can see Dumbledore teaching the exact same lesson. Yes, yes. Okay, so yeah, I, we both thought of the same thing. Great minds think alike. The, so this is interesting because the Fantastic Beasts are technically canon to the books, not the movies, even though they are movies that go along with the eight movies, which gets very confusing. But yeah, that is canon. So Dumbledore was a Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher and did do that same lesson. So we definitely did tell Lupin to do that same lesson so that he could find out what Harry's greatest fear is. And his greatest fear was fear itself. Is to not trust the mentors. It is essential that they do not get to Harry because Harry losing his soul pretty much means Voldemort wins. Oh my God, yeah. So what would happen then? If Harry had no soul, if it was sucked out and he was basically just in a vegetative state, yeah, like, I guess the prophecy wouldn't actually 
be carried out or it would be and Dumbledore would just find him and kill him really easily but yeah they the wizarding world would be screwed if Harry got his soul sucked out that's such an interesting thing to think about and Lupin is not just the man who knows all about Patronuses but he's also a great candidate for teaching Harry the value of someone's soul Voldemort had made a grave error in ripping his soul into so many pieces earlier in the book Harry was very quick to offer up Sirius to the Dementors but by the end he is not willing to let someone whose crimes are even worse suffer a fate that is not as bad but also because he doesn't want Lupin and Sirius to become murderers interesting yeah so Harry did have a flip because earlier in the book he was like he deserves the Dementor's kiss and Lupin's like does anyone really deserve that and then yeah so that is so important because when you murder your soul is split apart yeah so Dumbledore making sure that Harry understood the value of a soul that's something I never even thought about so yeah he did learn the value of what your soul means and Dumbledore's method of teaching Harry this lesson throughout the year is once again through Hagrid. It's always Hagrid. It's always Hagrid. Hagrid is always at the center of Dumbledore's plan, whether he knows it or not. <laughs> This year, Dumbledore has Hagrid inform the Golden Trio every step of the way about Buckbeak's trial. A trial that certainly Dumbledore could have cleared up in like 15 minutes after breakfast one day if he'd really wanted to. But it is a clear situation where an innocent party is going to be punished by murder. Which then happens to be a great lesson for Harry to learn the value of innocence. Saving innocent lives is more important than punishing guilty ones even if that means the return of Voldemort. So Dumbledore knew that Voldemort was coming back, so he prioritized Harry learning certain lessons that he needed him to know. And yeah, Dumbledore did show Harry everything about innocence in the third book, like saving Sirius, saving Buckbeak. Remember he said more than one innocent life can be saved. Guys, welcome to part four of Dumbledore's Big Plan. Has the same shirt on. This time he's got a jacket over it, though. Changing it up a bit, but still the same shirt. Man, laundry is done fast in Jay's house. Bertha Jorkins. Barty Crouch. We relight the Goblet of Fire. Harry's the champion. Did you put your name in the Goblet of Fire? No way. The cup is a porky. Harry's blood. Havana Kedavra. That's where it goes wrong. <laughs> that was the best recap I think I've ever seen of a Harry Potter movie. It gives me... Olaf vibes from Frozen 2 where he recaps Frozen 1. One of the funniest moments in all of the Frozen movies. Also, when Jay did that tongue flick and then the famous, did you put your name in the goblet of fire, Harry? That was perfect. Perfectly executed. Such a good idea. His first goal is to introduce Harry to the wider wizarding world. That's true. Harry does need to know more about the wizarding world because most of what he knows is at Hogwarts. That's like all he knows about the Wizarding World at this point. And obviously Harry does that by going to the Quidditch World Cup. That was the first exposure he got to the rest of the Wizarding World, which makes me wonder, did Dumbledore set that up? Dumbledore is the one behind this generosity. Yeah, every single time I think of something, they say it right after me. Great minds think alike, you know? The oh-so-poor Weasleys, who have somehow managed to not just get tickets to the event, but also tickets for guests, and also they're the best tickets in the entire stadium in the top box. The idea that Ludo is giving away 10 of the best tickets in the entire stadium for a favor he is like twice removed from is just just laughable, especially, and this is really important, when you consider that Ludo Bagman is in terrible debt. Selling those tickets rather than giving them to Arthur would have been easily the fastest way out of debt. That, that just convinced me 100% on what they're saying right here. Had it been up to Ludo, he would have sold those 10 tickets for so many galleons. But instead, Dumbledore told him get the Weasleys to the Quidditch World Cup so that Harry can see the rest of the Wizarding World. And speaking of the Triwizard Tournament, that is part two of Dumbledore's plan to expose Harry to the wider Wizarding World. Yeah, that would, that would be a great way to introduce him. Too bad it didn't work though, because, well, I guess he did still interact with them, but, but because his name came out of the Goblet of Fire, he couldn't sit back and just enjoy everybody there. He was worried about the task. So I guess that didn't really work out for Dumbledore. Let's dive into goal number two, which is educating Harry about the unforgivable curses. Dumbledore actually did want Moody to teach the students about these curses. Yeah, so I, I believe, I do, I think they're right. I think Dumbledore always intended for Moody or the real Moody who was replaced by Barty Crouch Jr. to teach them the unforgivable curses. 
Because can you imagine if Harry never learned that? Like, would Harry have even known what the killing curse was? Because you're not supposed to learn these curses until the sixth year of, at Hogwarts. What if he didn't have as much urgency to get out of the way when Voldemort said, Avada Kedavra, and he like jumped behind that headstone he very well could have just been like oh it's just a normal spell like it, it might hurt but like he might not have known that it would kill him but that brings me to goal number three showing harry what the wizarding world was like the last time voldemort was at large this happens when harry accidentally discovers and enters the pensive in Dumbledore's office and witnesses the trials of Karkaroff, Bagman, and Barty Crouch Jr. yeah yeah, it, like it, it was open just a little bit with the light coming in like there there's no way that Dumbledore didn't plan that although like so their point is like basically like Dumbledore knew that Harry was coming but did he know Harry was coming he was in a meeting with um, Moody and Fudge and then Harry had a bad dream and came to Dumbledore's office how could have Dumbledore have predicted that maybe he knocked it open a little bit as they were leaving and Harry just didn't notice it so then Harry would so then it would get Harry's attention, basically. Possibly the most important line in this whole book as it relates to Dumbledore's plan. For a fleeting instant, Harry thought he saw a gleam of something like triumph in Dumbledore's eyes. Yeah, so that was when he found out that Voldemort had put Harry's blood inside of him. Basically, Dumbledore knew that he, he had basically won. He knew that he had won. And the triumph is Dumbledore realizing that for the first time, Harry might actually have a way to survive the final duel with Voldemort. Oh, yeah. So I was saying like Dumbledore knew that he won, but I guess, yeah, they're right. The thing that really made his eye gleam was the fact that he realized Harry didn't have to die. So up until that point, up until this point at the end of the fourth book, he thought that Harry was going to die. Imagine how much weight that was on his shoulders that was just lifted with this one statement told to him by Harry. He realized that the boy that he had grown to care so much for would survive. Voldemort is now sort of acting as a love crux, if you will, to Harry and tethering him to life. I love that saying, love crux. I never thought about that. But yeah, basically Harry is a love crux because Voldemort taking Harry's blood essentially keeps him alive, just like a horcrux would. Guys, welcome to part five of Dumbledore's big plan. Still has the same shirt. Five weeks in a row. That's a lot of laundry is to finally tell Harry the contents of the prophecy and why Voldemort is after him. Which, let's be real, it is about time. Well, it's a good thing we saved the Philosopher's Stone, but why did Voldemort try and kill me as a baby? I know Philosopher's Stone, right? I could, I swear, Harry, I swear I had some Birdie Bot's beans here. Wow, Professor, I can't believe I killed a basilisk, but why did Voldemort try and kill me as a baby? Dude, have you seen this sword? This thing is awesome. How much do you think we could sell it for? Wow, can you believe time travel's real? And Voldemort's coming back because Pettigrew escaped. I really would like to know why he tried to kill me. Hippogriffs are as hippogriffs do, Harry. And uh, maybe have some chocolate. It helps for the Dementos. <laughs> Drake is dead. Why did he keep trying to kill me? Oh, God, he's crying. Uh, I think I left those beans back in my office. I'm just gonna... That was a great skit. Very well acted. Well done, Jay. Well done. Voldemort's return means that Harry is in as much danger as he has ever been in. And it's better if Harry is left completely isolated the entire time. Yeah, that, yeah. so Dumbledore kept him isolated at the Dursleys because his mother's protection would protect him there until he was 17 because Lily's blood lives in her sister's blood, Aunt Petunia, therefore keeping the protection alive. Why he doesn't just tell Harry that this protection is in place is beyond me, but hey. Yeah, honestly, like why, why didn't he just tell him? Well, no, I guess like there's really no reason why he wouldn't tell him that. Why doesn't Dumbledore just tell Harry about the prophecy? Cause like, if he known, then he wouldn't have been lured to the ministry and he would have just been like, in on everything and Sirius maybe didn't need to die so no like so he can't tell um Harry the prophecy because he knew that Voldemort was going into his mind like he knew that Voldemort was eventually going to do that especially now that he's back and more powerful so if he told Harry the prophecy Voldemort might be able to go into Harry's head and get that prophecy which is the plot of the whole fifth book Voldemort is trying to hear the rest of what was foretold 
So yeah, no, like, so that's why Harry couldn't know the prophecy. So the reason Dumbledore doesn't tell him is because he's afraid then Voldemort will be able to access his mind and gain the information about the prophecy. Yeah, there it is. They, they know, they know what they're talking about. I shouldn't have questioned them. This is when Dumbledore decides to implement occlumency lessons for Harry with his least favorite teacher ever. Yeah, so Dumbledore is making Harry do occlumency lessons so that he can block Voldemort out and so that when Voldemort is blocked out, he can eventually tell Harry what the prophecy is without Voldemort finding out. But I think the real reason Dumbledore wants Harry to know occlumency is because he has finally come to accept that it's the only safe way he will be able to tell Harry the prophecy. Yeah, okay, so they just said what I said. See, this is why we're the two biggest Harry Potter YouTubers. We understand Harry Potter like no one else. Like, it's cool because like uh, watching their videos, I'm like, oh, I didn't think about that. But then there's also times where I'm like, oh yeah, like thinking exactly what I'm thinking. It's cool, it's cool to see. Of course, if it was me, I might have told Harry that was the situation like, hey, if you master this skill, I can actually tell you what the weapon is. Honestly, yeah, like Harry probably would have tried harder at Occlumency if he knew that there was a prize of finding out what the weapon was. But I don't think that's the only reason why he didn't tell Harry. I think it was also because he cared so much about Harry that it would be too painful to tell him that he has to die. When he tells him the prophecy, he has to know that neither can live while the other survives. The reason he doesn't want to tell Harry about the prophecy is because he has grown to care for Harry too much. Yep. Again, great minds think alike. Said exactly the same thing. Which is to demonstrate the corruption of the ministry. Could it instead be the case that Umbridge is actually part of Dumbledore's big plan? Oh. So Dumbledore wanted Harry to see how corrupt the ministry was, so he purposefully didn't pick a defense against the dark arts teacher, knowing that the law said that the ministry would then send one of their people. Does it strike you as at all odd that Dumbledore, the leader of the Order of the Phoenix, a secret defense against the dark arts society, can't find a teacher for the post of defense against the dark arts? <laughs> Yeah, like, so that proves that even more. Like, he has so many people at his disposal to teach Defense Against the Dark Arts. He had already picked two people from the Order, Moody, who obviously like, didn't actually teach, and Lupin. But yeah, he could have picked Tonks, he could have picked Kingsley, he could have picked Arthur, some more obscure people like Sturgis Podmore, Emmeline Vance, Alphias Doge, one of his oldest friends. And he could have even picked, like, one of the Weasley kids like Bill or Charlie, they would have been great teachers too. So yeah, obviously Dumbledore had so many people at his disposal to teach defense against the dark arts. So it only makes sense that he didn't pick one, knowing that the ministry would then send someone and would then make Harry distrust the ministry and instead trust Dumbledore even more, which is exactly what happened. When Rufus Scrimger came to him in the sixth book, he was like, I'm Dumbledore's man through and through. I'm not working with you. Dumbledore wants Harry to understand the corruption of the ministry and to double down on Harry's loyalty to Dumbledore. Yeah, said the same, same thing again. That's a pattern in this video. I say something and then they say it right after me. It shows that we both like look at the series in very similar ways because we both gone so far into the lore of Harry Potter. Her control there does serve as a very good small scale example of what it might be like if Voldemort takes over the ministry. Umbridge comes across a thing she can't control? No problem, she just passes another law. Did those laws make things harder for her? No problem, her and the Inquisitorial Squad are just above the law. Voldemort and the Death Eaters are the exact same way. That's so true. I actually never thought about that part. So yeah, it, it's also great foreshadowing for what's going to happen. Umbridge is Voldemort taking over the school, which is the ministry, the inquisitorial squad are the Death Eaters, and it foreshadows what is going to happen with Voldemort taking over the Ministry of Magic. Wow, I love that. Dumbledore might not have told Harry to form a secret defense league, but he did also have Harry stay at the headquarters of his own secret defense league. Yeah, so yeah, like Dumbledore's army is Harry's version of Dumbledore's Order of the Phoenix. Dumbledore tells Harry, I defy anyone who has watched you as I have, and I have watched you more closely than you can have imagined, not to want to save you more pain than you had already suffered. 
First of all, there it is, right there. Dumbledore just admitting to the plan, always having someone nearby to keep an eye on Harry and push him in the right direction when he needed it. Yeah, so honestly, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if that line right there is what inspired this entire series for them. Like, they probably read that and was like, wait, Dumbledore did plan this all the time. Let's break this down. I wouldn't be surprised if that was like the origin of it. But despite his honesty and despite Dumbledore telling Harry he was going to tell him everything, he doesn't. He still has at least three aces left up his sleeve. Okay, wait, so three aces. So let me think if I, if I can think of all of them. There's... The fact that Harry is a Horcrux, the fact that Snape loves Lily, and the Deathly Hallows? Yeah, we'll see. Welcome to part six of Dumbledore's big plan. So I guess we won't find out um, what the three aces were now, but I'm sure they'll come back to it. And also, Jay's wearing the same shirt six weeks in a row. That's dedication right there. Let's start with what Dumbledore is doing rather than what he isn't doing, which is teaching Harry about Voldemort's past and what kind of person he is. The best part of the entire series, at least in my opinion. I think that is like literally my favorite part of the entire Harry Potter series, finding out Voldemort's past. Uh, I'm, I might be biased though, because Voldemort's my favorite character. He will hate watching the others struck down around him, knowing that it is for him that it happens. Voldemort thinks Harry will come to the forest out of guilt and fear, not out of selflessness, and certainly not as a means to defeat him. Yeah, and that's, that's the reason why Voldemort loses. How Voldemort chose places that were significant to himself as hiding spots for the Horcruxes. And his absolute affinity for Hogwarts and anything to do with it. Yeah, he was obsessed with Hogwarts. Honestly, it's one of the very few, if not the only thing that he truly felt a connection to. And what I kind of love about Dumbledore teaching Harry all of this is the faith it demonstrates in Harry. Because at that point, Dumbledore has already arranged his death with Snape and he already knows everything Harry knows, if not more, and yet he himself has not located all of the Horcruxes. Yeah, like he, he puts a lot of trust in Harry, which is one of my favorite parts about their relationship is that Dumbledore trusts Harry through and through. Just like Harry said, I'm Dumbledore's man through and through. And I always think of that one scene in the cave where um, Harry's like, don't worry, Professor, I've got you. And Dumbledore's like, I'm not worried, Harry. I'm with you. It's all right, sir. Don't worry. I'm really there. I'm not worried, Harry. I'm with you. We talked about a gleam of triumph in Dumbledore's eyes. Dumbledore realized Harry might have a way back, might have a way to survive. Until that moment, Dumbledore kind of was just raising Harry as a pig for slaughter. Yeah, I said that earlier in the video that Dumbledore thought that Harry was going to have to really die and not come back for the first four books. At the end of The Goblet of Fire, he realized that he didn't when he got that gleam in his eye after finding out that Voldemort put Harry's blood in him. That line from Snape that um, Dumbledore was raising him like a pig for slaughter, it turned out not to be true when it came time for the Deathly Hallows when Snape said that. But in the beginning, those first four years, Dumbledore really was raising him like a pig for slaughter. Dumbledore, though, who has come to care for Harry, suspects that survival is a possible outcome, and so starts leading Harry down the path towards that goal, which is why he does not tell him the following things. Okay, so we're about to find out what those three things that I listed were. Let's see if I got them right. First is that Snape loved Lily. Second is the existence of the Deathly Hallows. And third, that Harry himself is a Horcrux. There we go. I got all three of them. Let's go. If you've ever thought it was super convenient the way in which Snape finally eventually does give Harry this information that, wow, if Voldemort had just used the Vada Kedavra and not killed Snape with Nagini, that would have been the end of it. Harry never would have known. So obviously, yeah, Voldemort used Nagini to kill Snape. And I always believed that that was because he thought that Snape was the master of the Elder Wand. And he didn't want to use the wand that was loyal to Snape on on Snape himself, the master of the wand, because it might backfire, which is exactly what happened when he went to fight Harry in the final battle. The reason Voldemort doesn't use Avada Kedavra against Snape is because he believes Snape is the master of the Elder Wand, so he doesn't want to use the Elder Wand against Snape because he thinks it's going to backfire in the exact way it does against Harry later on. I finally figured that out last week, and I've been like dying to tell you guys. Yeah, that's very, that's pretty much exactly what I just said. I'm surprised that it took him that long to figure it out, though. I feel like I 
I feel like I thought of that the first time I read the series. I don't know, let me know in the comments below. Did you guys figure it out that fast? I'm interested to hear your thoughts. And the stone in particular here is the most crucial. It is the final piece of the puzzle for Dumbledore, the thing he thinks will help Harry walk into death. It is really like the final puzzle piece that Dumbledore had to put together to make sure that Harry didn't back out. Once he talked to his loved ones that had all passed, he knew that Harry was not going to back down from having the same fate as them. And he can't tell Harry about the Hallows earlier because it might seem like a way that Harry can survive death. And Harry can't think that he can survive death because then he can't survive death. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> Took me a minute. Harry must not know, not until the last moment, not until it is necessary. Otherwise, how could he have the strength to do what must be done? Revealing this information to Harry is tantamount to just telling him the whole plan. Telling him that this whole time, he has just been intending for Harry to die, which I dare say would undermine quite a bit of the trust he'd built up over the past six years. Yeah, like how, so, had he told Harry that earlier, how would he have reacted? If he found out sooner that he had to die, what would be his reaction? And as this, as they said, like, according to this, part of the plan was to gain Harry's trust. He had a bunch of different things lined up to make sure that Harry trusted him in the way that he did. Would Harry feel betrayed then? Guys, welcome to part seven of Dumbledore's big plan. Wow, he really wore that shirt all seven weeks. That's crazy. That's dedication right there. He really rocked that shirt for seven freaking weeks. Dumbledore is dead, so you might be wondering, uh, what plans could he possibly even still have in motion? Yeah, so like, I'm interested. I'm interested to see where they go with this because they pretty much revealed the whole plan already. Yeah, like Dumbledore is dead. What what is left? I'm interested. I mean, it's an 18 minute video for the final part, so I'm interested to see what they say for it. This week, however, we go even deeper to reveal Dumbledore's plan not just to protect Harry's physical existence, but also his soul. Oh, okay, okay. So I see where they're going with this. When I finally got to the final battle, Harry and Voldemort are circling each other in the Great Hall, and Voldemort has the Elder Wand, but Harry has a few more secrets. <gasps> Draco disarmed Dumbledore. <gasps> Harry took that wand from Draco! Harry is the master of the Elder Wand! Oh my god. Expelliarmus! Bang! Wins! Kapow! Yeah, that's pretty much how I experienced it. <laughs> very well told, very well told. The Elder Wand wasn't really that important to the final battle. Harry is basically invincible against Voldemort. Since Goblet of Fire, when Voldemort used Harry's blood to regenerate his body, the two have both been acting as each other's anchors to life. Lily's sacrificial love is kept alive in Voldemort, who anchors Harry, and Harry has a piece of Voldemort's soul inside of him, anchoring Voldemort. That's so interesting. So I always knew that Harry had a piece of Voldemort in him for the Horcrux, but I never really thought about this love crux, as they call it. I love that name for it. That's such an interesting thing to think about. Like, it, it's true, though. Like, I always knew that was the case, but I never was able to, like, put it into words the way they were. Meaning that Voldemort cannot kill Harry, but that Harry can kill Voldemort. So whoever's the master of the Elder Wand doesn't really matter. Harry has won the fight before it's even started. And when I first realized this, it was kind of a bummer to me. I mean, it's the climax of the entire series, and the fight is about who controls the Elder Wand. Like, how could it not matter? Jeez. Thanks for ruining the final battle for me, Jay. Jesus. What was the point? Why go through all that trouble to ensure that Harry was in fact master of the Elder Wand? What difference did it make? And the answer is that it made all the difference in the world. Okay, so yeah, all right. So they didn't actually ruin the final battle for me and we're gonna find out why. I'm interested to see this. But there was also a fourth object left in Dumbledore's will, which tells the rest of his plan. The Sword of Gryffindor. Yeah, so Scrimger didn't give Harry the um, Sword of Gryffindor, even though it was in his will. Um, so he was supposed to give it with Tales of Beetle the Bard and the Deluminator and the Snitch as well, but Scrimger said no. So there is a theory, like I've heard this before, and I, I, I don't know if I thought of it or if I read it somewhere, but basically Dumbledore never intended for Scrimger to give Harry the sword. He always knew that Scrimger wouldn't give it to him, but he needed Harry to know that Dumbledore wanted him to have the sword. 
so that he would know he has to go and find it. He left it in his will, and the will was written before the events of the night of Dumbledore's death, which is important because it means that Dumbledore never intended to give Harry the sword. Dumbledore was not just going to hand it over. He always intended Harry to receive the sword post-mortem. Yeah, so that's basically what I just said, but with a whole lot more evidence behind it that explains why that is. But yeah, he never intended Harry to have the sword, even though it was in his will. I will say it is possible that Dumbledore did intend to at least show Harry how to use the sword to destroy a Horcrux so that later on, when the will was read, Harry at least understood why he was being given the sword. Yeah, but he, yeah, so he of course died before he could do that. Although... It wasn't the real Horcrux, so he couldn't show Harry how to destroy the Horcrux. But I guess he could just tell Harry, like, there's Basilisk Venom impregnated into the sword, which in turn destroys the Horcrux. So yeah, I guess, like, he couldn't have shown him because it wasn't the real locket, but he could tell him. He was still having to face the fact that the prophecy pretty much condemned Harry to become a murderer. Murder is the supreme act of evil that rips one's soul. His soul seemed doomed to be very badly damaged. So he concocts a way around it. A way for Voldemort to kill himself by falsely believing that he is the master of the Elder Wand when in actuality, it's Harry. That's interesting to think about because without Dumbledore's planning for this, Harry would have had to commit a murder, which would in turn split his, split his soul. But the question is, could Harry have done that? Could he have killed Voldemort? Because if we think back, he did not want Pettigrew to die, and he wasn't even the one killing him. It was Sirius and Lupin. What do you guys think? Let me know in the comments below. Do you think that Harry could have gone through with it and killed Voldemort if it came down to it? Let me know. He also intended for Snape to become the master of the Elder Wand. Which, okay, in case you didn't catch it, that is basically Dumbledore sentencing Snape to death. He intended Snape to become master of the wand and also was sure that Voldemort would go after it. Yeah, yeah, so that, as he was saying that, I was like, yeah, Snape was always meant to die. Dumbledore was always going to use him to be murdered by Voldemort. Whether Snape knew that? I don't know, like, he's such a smart man. He definitely did know that, but I don't know. Like, he seemed pretty shocked when it happened. No, but I feel like Snape would know that that would happen, though. What I think his original plan was, was for his portrait to instruct Snape to duel Harry and lose on purpose. Okay, so if you lose on purpose, would it count if you basically didn't technically win? Well, if Snape intends to lose the duel with Harry, then really neither the wand nor the sword should shift its allegiance to Harry. Yes, yeah, so this is the question that I was asking. So uh, let's see what Jay has to say about it. Well, first of all, the wand doesn't care. Dumbledore plans his death with Snape and is still confident that the wand will shift his allegiance to Snape. So as far as the wand is concerned, dead is dead. Disarmed is disarmed. Yeah, okay, yeah, so that, yeah, he's right, yeah. So it would transfer over even if you let someone beat you because Dumbledore was going to let Snape kill him without fighting back. Then later on, Voldemort in his quest for the Elder Wand would realize he needed to kill Snape, which he would do, falsely believe that he was the master of the Elder Wand, and then in the final match between Harry, it would backfire because it doesn't want to fire on its true master, and kaboom, Harry wins the day. Voldemort kills himself, Harry's soul is intact, and it really is so perfect. So what they're saying is basically, Dumbledore's plan was carried out perfectly, even though things went wrong. But there you go, guys. That is part seven of Dumbledore's big plan. I hope you have enjoyed watching this series as much as we have enjoyed making it. It has been so much fun. Yes, yeah, so a big round of applause to them for this. This was an amazing series of videos. Um, I'm glad I got to react to it and share my thoughts about it. Overall, I really like the breakdown. I think it had a lot of good theories in there. Some already established online, but also mixed in with, of course, Super Carlin Brothers own original theories that of course add so much to it. I just love seeing their point of view of Harry Potter because as you saw in the video, like we have a lot of the same thoughts about Harry Potter. We think the same way about it because we've both gone so far into the series. So it's always fun to watch another Harry Potter expert go into it and actually get to react to it. It's fun. 
I hope you guys enjoyed this video. In the description below, I linked their video for their entire Dumbledore's plan. So click on the link, show them some love, tell them Movie Flame sent you. That's all I have for you guys this week though, so I will see you in the next video. Thank you so much for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. You can follow me on Instagram to see more of my personal life, like my cute dog Loki, and some behind the scenes Movie Flame stuff. I also do similar content on TikTok and Twitter that I do here on this channel, so if you like what I do here, check them out. All the handles are right below me, and links are in the description. Over here are my wonderful patrons. If you want to be featured on the next video, plus get a few other perks, become a patron today. As always, if you liked the video, hit that like button and subscribe, and look out for more great Movie Flame videos on the way.